Thank you everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions now or during today's presentation, please type them into the chat box or questions pane in the Zoom control panel. Without further ado, I would like to pass the platform to Dr. Carl Horvath, President at Campus Consortium. Over to you, Carl. Thank you, Lily. And thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, this is a Campus Consortium Ed Talk webinar. And uh, this is a monthly series of webinars where we address issues and topics in education uh, revolving mostly around technology, but uh, no topic is uh, too, not too important to discuss. Um, and I'm just going to give a shout out to a few uh, folks who are attending here uh, from many different institutions. Uh, looking at people from all over the country, uh, everywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast. And uh, we even have Anchorage, Alaska, uh, Anchorage University here. So welcome, thank you for joining. And uh, we have uh, University of California, uh, Los Angeles, Ithaca College, Seton University. Uh, we have some schools in New York, San Diego State University, we have Oregon State uh, University, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, Kent State, uh, Stanford Healthcare, uh, we have Bridgewater, uh, Wilkes University, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, Oakland, Campbell, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and uh, Stanford uh, University, Allegheny College, we have a few K-12s as well who have joined us and uh, thank you for those school districts who have uh, signed up. Uh, you know, technology crosses higher education and K-12. Uh, so everybody has to use technology and uh, we support uh, technology and education. We also have uh, Columbia uh, University, Swarthmore College, and uh, St. Bonaventure University. And of course, uh, I see Richard Wack. Richard, thanks for joining again. He's a uh, frequent attendee from Villanova University in Philadelphia. So uh, appreciate everybody taking the time today to uh, be here. I uh, wanted to give every, everyone an idea of uh, who was attending in the audience. Um, so we have a great panel today. Uh, we have, uh, uh, academic leaders uh, who will uh, speak on the topic of our uh, uh, subject line, which is rethinking student uh, learning and en engagement technology and education. Uh, so my name is Carl Horbath. I'm the president of Campus Consortium. We're a inter uh, national uh, technology association. We support schools uh, in terms of technology. And uh, this is one of our monthly webinars uh, called an ed talk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Campus Consortium. It uh, was founded 2003, and our mission is to serve uh, all our members and anyone in the education sector. Uh, we uh, are a liaison, we're an advocate, a contact manager uh, to help all institutions, including underserved communities and institutions, uh, to make sure that all education institutions and the students that attend them have equitable access to technology. And we try to help them overcome financial and resource challenges. Uh, here's a few of the, uh, we have different programs and services. So these are some current uh, opening kind grants that are set to expire, I guess at the end of the month, looks like April 29th. So if you're interested in finding out more about these, please visit our website at campusconsortium.org. And I also wanna put a shout out to our, our sponsors. Uh, these are ed tech sponsors that uh, are partners of Campus Consortium, and uh, we vet all our ed tech vendors. Uh, and our responsibility is to our members to make sure they're getting quality value uh, from the ed tech vendors. Uh, and and you know a lot of these vendors offer everything from in kind grants to special pricing and packages. So uh, if you are searching uh, for a particular application product or service related to IT. Uh, we can often help with that and provide the best value because they give special pricing through Campus Consortium. Also want to uh, give a shout out to Cambridge College and Duke Law for uh, our representatives today who are both from these institutions. 
And uh, I'd like to just start off talking a little bit about how we came to this topic for this webinar. And uh, from a very informal uh, uh, content analysis of a lot of the education news, blogs, journals, and publications, there's a few keywords that really started popping up, uh, especially in the past couple of years in a lot of the content. And uh, on the left side, uh, you see the R's, on the right side, you see the T's, but they're very often used. Rethink, reimagine, redefine, reinvent, revitalize. So uh, these are all uh, uh, articles that uh, we've read that really talk about uh, thinking about a new way to do what maybe has been done for decades or even hundreds of years. Uh, what's the new approach? Um, also, where there's a lot of articles and journal articles have the word transformation, transition, transvalue, transfigure, transmognify, uh, uh, mogrify, you know, so magical changes uh, from the influence of technology. And so I guess our discussion today is really going to be, do you think that uh, uh, technology really uh, causes some fundamental uh, research? Uh, thinking of education, does it really fundamentally change it? Or is it really a support uh, to, uh, to education and should always be looked at that way? And we have some uh, consistent pedagogical uh, legacy processes and procedures that will work forever. Uh, so uh, that led to us kind of using the word rethinking student learning and engagement in our title today. Uh, of course, it centers around technology and education mostly because that's where a lot of the impacts have come. And of course, anyone that's been through the pandemic knows that uh, their institution most likely relied on technology. Uh, and so has that made an impact on your institution? We're gonna ask a few poll questions of our audience. Um, and as we go through this presentation, because we like to have a two-way conversation, not just us talking to you, but you also telling us your thoughts. Uh, so as Lily mentioned in the beginning, we have a, a Q and A uh, window uh, pane for you to uh, post questions. Uh, but I'd like you to please participate in these quick polls. We'll only keep them open for 30 seconds. Uh, have changes in society, impacts of the pandemic and uh, ubiquitous technology prompted your institution to modify academic and administrative strategy. And so the three answers we put down are minimally, you know, there's been some minor adjustments, but we're mostly back to normal, uh, somewhat. Some program changes, a lot of hybrid and flex has been uh, uh, programs and, and, and uh, resources have been uh, you know, implemented in many institutions or significantly, we've remodeled our academic programs and student services. So please uh, just take the next 30 seconds uh, to all our attendees for this webinar and give us your perspective from your institution. I'm gonna to jump to the next uh, slide, which is really, I'm gonna run through just a couple slides that speak to you know, some of the research that we did to set this question up for our guest panelists today. And uh, you can see a list here under rethinking education. Uh, there are, these are all titles of either journal articles, uh, uh, news articles in publications like Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, some of these titles are from McKinsey Reports, uh, uh, which is a consultant group, uh, and, and, and many other sources. But you can see there's a pattern here of even uh, mostly rethinking, a few reimagining. Uh, and this is where we came up with that list at the very beginning of our presentation. Um, and you can see also that many of these uh, dates, uh, they actually start several years ago, 2012, 17, 18, uh, but they really accelerate as of the pandemic. So the pandemic certainly had some impact on uh, the influence of technology and education. Before we move on to the next slide, I wanna share the results of this first poll question. 
have changes in society, impacts the pandemic and ubiquitous technology prompted your institution to modify academic and administrative strategy. And 17% uh, minimally uh, that, you know, we're, we, we made some minor adjustments, but we're back to mostly normal. 57% uh, did the hybrid, hybrid and flex approach. So yeah, they've made some, uh, maybe some substantial changes, but they're using their, uh, you know, legacy practices as well. And then 26% significantly remodeled their academic programs and student services. So interesting uh, results uh, on that poll question. Uh, in, impacts, want to run through just a quick, two quick slides of impacts, growing skills gap uh, of career and technical education. Uh, we know the influence of technology and the demographics of today's student are different than generations before. Uh, rising costs and impact of the economy, new uh, digital uh, DEI. Are we even thinking about that as it's in the news? And uh, we, and, and on top of society's mind in regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion, are we also paying attention to uh, digital DEI in terms of our applications, access uh, to systems and resources, internet, computers, tablets, and even training and instruction on how to use technology for students? Other impacts are the uh, way we're delivering education. Uh, institutional responsiveness, uh, how able are your institutions uh, to be able to respond to the needs of technology? Uh, you know, for-profit uh, organizations and businesses often have funding uh, or try to uh, keep up with the latest technologies, but yeah, a lot of educational institutions do not have the financial resources uh, nor do they have the expertise in-house to deal with, uh, you know, some of the mo very frequent changes that uh, continue to happen. Uh, in innovation is, is continuously putting new technology out there, and all the students that many institutions are servicing are used to the technology, and how do institutions provide this for their student expectations? And of course, faculty, you know, how do we make sure they are uh, up to date with the latest teaching and learning uh, technologies? And how does that incorporate into uh, their pedagogy, their teaching practices, and how they communicate, connect, and uh, influence their students with the content of what they're trying to uh, get across in their courses and degree programs. Here's a uh, quick poll uh, that was from last year from Carnegie Corporation run a Gallup poll to try to get the sensibility of parents, uh, you know, in terms of uh, our college age students. And of course, we know that our college age students have changed uh, from uh, decades ago to being more high school graduates to a, a broader mix. And I, I think Stephen uh, can, can speak to this more from his institution, but this poll uh, shows, uh, please uh, think about your ideal situation. Looks like 54% of uh, uh, people, which seems low to me, think a four-year college is, of course, the right, the next thing to do, but others are looking at other pathways. And so, I don't know, Steve, do you, do you have, I, I know your institution's very dedicated to the adult learner and no. uh, new, new careers. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in a way, that, that question is posed to, to a more traditional, probably model, the, the, the 18 to 22-year-old first-time, full-time uh, bracket. But it, do, it doesn't surprise me that there's a broader range of like desired outcomes for for uh, families and their 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 kids. Uh, uh, some of the things I'll sh share when I when I talk it has to do with that expanded range of things that are confronting ed education nowadays. Great, thank you. Yes, it should be uh, very interesting, and you know uh, the model is changing. I think for many many institutions. Uh, this is just my uh, final uh, quick slide to kind of summarize, you know, this idea to present this case, you know, to our panelists for them to kind of talk a little bit about some of these things. 
you know, uh, cer certainly the influence of uh, society, the type of student we're supporting today, uh, the, the innovation and advancement of technology and the increased dependency just in life uh, is, is really spilling over into the education environment and uh, really uh, requiring, I think, many institutions to at least address it, you know, in terms of how it's impacting the students and what they do to deliver teaching, learning, and student services. Uh, uh, there's also that sustainability, you know, how do you, uh, you, you may invest in technology, but uh, you know, some years institutions have to put money into facilities like repairing buildings instead of investing in technology infrastructure. Does, does that mean uh, you know, over the next two years, you can't keep up with the technology because you're fixing issues on campus? Um, and uh, you know, it, it's great, to, uh, there, there's a point down here that says, create an environment of deliberate evolution. Well, yeah, that's easy to say, you know, and it may be pie in the sky for some institutions that have very limited resources. Uh, it's a great sensibility to have because you're always awareness, you have a mindfulness of innovation and technology and change, but what can you do about it? So uh, just a few talking points here to, you know, kind of get us thinking. Here's uh, uh, our second poll question. Uh, I'd like the audience to please answer right before we introduce uh, Stephen uh, to our audience, uh, and he can uh, start uh, speaking to these some of these issues. Are fundamental policy and practice changes necessary across K-12 and higher education to meet the needs and expectations of 21st century students? Have students changed that much over the past decades where uh, you know, we really need to change the education model uh, due to the advancement of technology and the expectations of society. And so the three uh, responses could be, no, the education system will adapt over time, or maybe the pandemic and other issues mean at least some changes are necessary. And then, yes, education needs to address the impact of technology and a knowledge economy. Uh, so uh, if you could just take 30 seconds, audience, to please uh, answer uh, this poll. Uh, we'd love to see what your responses are um, to these questions. Uh, I'm going to move right into introducing our first panelist for today. Uh, this would be Dr. Healy, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Stephen Healy, currently serving as provost of Cambridge College, is a higher education leader and innovator with experience at every level of administration in a university environment. He's demonstrated history of advancing academic leadership through key contributions to the education sector. His roles include tenured professor, dean of arts and sciences, associate provost, provost, and president. Uh, Dr. Healy is experienced in overseeing budgets, managing accreditation, and resolving employee conflicts, as well as skill in career development, uh, student recruiting, and program development and evaluation. Uh, he specializes in challenging transitions, uh, personnel changes, and online campus hybridizations. Over the course of his career, he has pioneered groundbreaking solutions to address 21st century higher education challenges. And uh, 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 Steve, this really speaks to, I think also you're leading uh, the academics for a, a very forward thinking institution, which is Cambridge uh, because of the uh, you know, focus on uh, returning students or adult students or uh, uh, students that are actually exiting a career to come back and relearn uh, a, a whole new uh, degree, you know, earn a new degree for a whole new career. And I'm sorry, before I, I let you take it away, I'd love to just quickly share the results of this poll. Our fundamental policy and practice uh, changes necessary across K-12 and higher ed to meet the needs and expectations of 21st century. Uh, you know, very few uh, said no, uh, but some do, and 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 uh, that's fine because uh, th there's a lot of good. You know, that has uh, that is uh, of legacy teaching uh, and learning uh, practices and methods. 
Um, and then there's maybe 23% said maybe the, the pandemic and other issues have, you know, made a lot of people realize, hey, we have to, you know, make some changes here. Uh, but looks like an overwhelming number of people in our poll said, yes, education needs to address the impact of technology and a knowledge economy. And uh, so I think that the uh, audience is saying it does warrant some uh, uh, addressing this topic. So I'm just gonna uh, end that poll right there and I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Healy uh, to uh, take it away from here. Uh, well, very good. And thank you, Carl, for the invitation. Uh, and Lee, uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for joining this. I, I agreed with Carl to, to jump in here because he said you would answer all the hard questions that came later. So, so I'm looking forward both to your presentation and to learning from you in the QA session. Uh, so I served as president for, for about a year in, and uh, down at the University of Bridgeport before joining Cambridge College. The month I became president was, was um, March 2020. And if you remember what, what that date means, I, I literally convened one, maybe two on ground on campus meetings and then for the next year, uh, you know, work as president, uh, steering that institution through a time of change by way of this kind of technology that we're using here now. Uh, I had used Zoom very infrequently before that. I had used Skype a bit, FaceTime, uh, these sorts of things. But uh, the idea of Zoom just kind of overtook my experience. Uh, as Zoom has become a verb now. Uh, uh, and, and I guess Zoom is not careful, it's going to lose its trademark status <laughs> because the term is being used so, so broadly. I think it is a time of massive, massive ethos shift. Uh, I'll try to keep uh, tethered to the topic here as much as possible. I will say, say sometimes my thinking uh, drifts out into things like, um, you know, the global economy and politics. It's kind of a habit of my profession to think like that. And, and I don't wanna drift from the topic, but, but I will say that the topic of technology and learning is situated in larger changes. And the larger changes, I, I would just use a few words. Um, one is anxiety. I think there's tremendous anxiety and, and the agreements that we've had in our societies and in our political life and in our, in our relationship uh, globally with, with other powers is shifting and people are not sure what's going to happen next and they're not sure what to make of it. And that has a way of permeating everything else uh, that we do. I think you can get a read on it in the environment and even these technologies that we use, sometimes in our minds, we, we wanna pretend, I, I certainly do, that they're, they're environmentally neutral and, and they're most certainly not. I mean, these are energy consuming devices and things like that. So, so without, without dwelling on the topic, I just think that what we're doing now to think about this topic has got a tremendous amount of pressure on it from, from things that are really outside of our control. They, they're there uh, framing the background for us at, at every moment. But to come down a bit closer to the ground and, and to work on the idea of education nowadays, I, I've, I have, a, you know, the first topic here of poor Socrates. And if you'll remember Socrates, uh, he was uh, maybe the, the, the greatest of all teachers, you know, reflected on uh, by his student Plato as the most just man who, who ever lived. Uh, you, you read in, in um, uh, of his life, and, and, and he was an engaging uh, a teacher. He was also tremendously worried at, this, at his time uh, of a new technology, uh, the technology of writing. He felt that that would fundamentally shift things that were discovered in the teaching learning project, in the philosophical project that he uh, had engaged on with his students. So just be thinking about that as, as we are talking here about the new kinds of technology that we're using and all the adventures and the new possibilities uh, that come out because of that, there's always been, uh, I, I, I guess I'd propose, is this kind of reflection on change and change produced by new, new technologies for the learning project as a bit risky. 
So, um, so we could talk about that later, and, and I hope some, some good questions come out around it. I was also thinking about Socrates as just, you know, um, a teacher and what it's like to be a teacher nowadays. And I was delighted to hear some K-12 folks are on the, on, on the, on the podcast uh, because both higher education and K-12 education strike me now as under a kind of scrutiny that, that is really quite astonishing. Um, K-12 K and pre-K-12 teachers are held responsible for things that, that there's probably always been some of. It just strikes me though that the amount of scrutiny, the amount of criticism, the amount of demands made upon teachers has, has gone up. I think it's reflective of this larger anxiety I was talking about earlier, and almost as if we wanna ensure that the students that are being handled in our teaching learning enterprises are somehow being given a passport to their future. But we know that the future itself is in some way suspect and in doubt, we're not sure about it. And so we revisit that concern on teachers. I see it affecting uh, higher education uh, teachers as well. Uh, the range of things that, that, that they're confronting is, is really um, quite different, even from when I began my career in higher education 25 years ago. Uh, so for what that's worth, it's another kind of context that frames uh, what we're talking about. For every possible world, there's an actual world. And the actual worlds I have in mind is, you know, the lives of people that we're dealing with when, when we're teaching them with a technology like we're using here now. Uh, we're transported by this transmogrifying mystery right into their living rooms, right into their kitchens, you, you know, right into their lives. And, you know, with a moment's reflection or, or by listening to them, we know that it's not all equal. Uh, some have insufficient bandwidth. Some have uh, a, a bill due and they're not sure whether their cable will continue to work. I was telling Carl and Lee when I was signing on, for whatever reason today, my uh, desktop computer, which I assure you is brand new and wonderful all, all the time, but it wasn't working. I mean, the, the technology wasn't working. So that use of that technology and all of the powers that it brings, all of the new things that it makes possible also create these possible jams. You know, you could just think of all the possible ways we use technology and we use them because they're really quite amazing, quite wonderful. Uh, they also all create this kind of uh, back pressure uh, that, that can turn out to hurt the teaching learning pro prospect just at the wrong time. I'm also thinking here a bit about the viral uh, classroom. By viral classroom, of course, I do mean the pandemic. Uh, th this pandemic, uh, I'll, I'll speak here briefly about Cambridge College has produced tremendous sweeping change in how we deliver our programs to students. Uh, the, before I joined Cambridge College, the college had purchased the New England College for Business. And we continue uh, offering programs through that entity. We've rebranded it as CC Global, Cambridge College Global. That's an online delivery system that uses asynchronous uh, modes of instruction uh, primarily. Uh, the student recruitment from it is very largely from business to business relationships and also digital recruiting, but about 80% of the, the enrollment comes through the B2, B2B relationships. That has been here through the storm of the pandemic and it's been a source of, uh, you know, an anchor for how, how we uh, make adjustments in the rest of our space. The traditional side of Cambridge College, it's a non-traditional or adult serving, but if, if you want to say the traditional side, the on-ground side, at the moment of, of the pandemic, uh, like all of our institutions, did have to, in that March 2020 period, um, take upon uh, a retreat initially to Zoom and take upon an emergency shift. And then in the context of that emergency shift, begin to make uh, substantive changes to how teaching and learning was done. 
our students in that side have voted with their feet. Uh, about 90% of that part prefer to continue with Zoom mediated and technology mediated instruction. So we continue to serve in that way as a matter of serving students in a way that most makes most sense to them. It, it's reflecting their busy lives. It's reflecting adult learners with kids. It's reflecting what it's like even in a pandemic time to be driving around the city of Boston in rush hour trying to get to a physical campus. And so I expect that that's going to continue to be the case. I also expect we'll continue to rebuild our on-ground en enrollments over time. So as, 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 a, as a way of adjusting to that, we will then have really three major modalities. We'll have the online asynchronous, we'll have Zoom and technology mediated synchronous, and we'll have on-ground uh, instruction as well. I'm thinking about the viral classroom in another way, and I was just pondering this a bit, uh, just as a topic. And it strikes me that teachers nowadays never really know uh, whether someone in the, in the class isn't live streaming the instructional episode to Twitter or to, or, or, or to YouTube. I mean, these moments without context can be very, very embarrassing. Uh, they, they can, I, I suppose they could be funny and fun. It, you know, it's, it's not all just um, difficulty and terrifying possibilities, but, but that kind of inflects uh, the, the, the learning project. I think that the, 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 the um, connection between what goes on in a classroom and the outside world is more permeable now uh, than it has ever been. Uh, not that long ago, a student that came into the class might ask the professor, are you comfortable with me uh, taping the lecture? And I, I've heard professors say, no, I'm really not comfortable with that, so please don't do it. But probably most have allowed it, been comfortable with it. I always was, but, but, but now, um, yeah, there may not be a choice in how it's, how it's being done. And so I don't know exactly what that means, but I'll just put it out there as part of the virality of it. Now you can imagine a teacher in a classroom doing something that really was designed in that learning context to push the buttons of students, right? Because that's what helps the learning project. You have to ruffle some feathers sometimes to, to, to engage in good teaching. And absent that context, as it got put on a medium which it wasn't designed to be played on, it means something very different. It becomes a comedy show all of a sudden. So I'll just put that out there. Well, uh, I'll close here. My, my final topic is just the idea of change and the embrace of change. And I'll tell you, I wanna brag about professors. Um, I'm a, a professor in my own heart here, but I've been working on the administration for a long time. But I've stayed in higher education because I love teaching and learning. I love being a professor. I love supporting what they do. And, uh, you know, truth is, is that a, a great many professors, this would include me, uh, when they come to class, they, they, they come to it with a sense of wonder and awe, but also vulnerability. Every time is engaging of people in their life story. Every time something could go wrong, every time something could go right, you know, we can plan for things to go right, but there is that moment of real anxiety. And uh, I've spoken to hundreds of professors over the years, and a lot of us will embrace common things, common patterns, a reuse syllabus, uh, lectures that are used again and refreshed, not because we're lazy, uh, not because that they don't care, not because, no, it's because those conservatisms um, give a foundation to uh, pursue learning and to push students in ways that they know are appropriate. Sometimes that means that there is resistance comes in to forms of change that would be really good. Uh, and I guess I would say, you know, online learning is one of those areas and, and for a lot of colleges in whatever, in, in what other, in whatever way uh, that, that it's being pursued. Uh, and it strikes me that 
this period of pandemic, because there wasn't really a choice, it became a necessity, that that necessity pushed on all of us to be the mother of contravention. It gave us the ability to rethink our old patterns, to discover a new way of doing it, to jump out there and to begin using these technologies. We didn't like that we felt brand new at it. We didn't like that we felt like we were doing our first year of lectures all over again. Uh, but like our first year of lectures, we got through it, we learned from it, we got better. And I think we're prepared now in a way we weren't before to fundamentally change teaching and learning with this technology in mind. Carl, I'll, I'll leave it at that and then uh, hand it over to you and Lee. Very good. Uh, so, so Steve, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, you know you that, you know what you mentioned about being president and then immediately having to deal with the pandemic. Uh, I mean, that must have been uh, you know quite uh, an impactful time in your career, your life. Uh, you know, this is a uh, a, a different role. You know, uh, you know, where you're leading this entire you know institution and. And you know, uh, certainly, it sounds like you did what had to be done, you know, which was address the situation. Um, so I, I think many people that I've talked to, presidents, you know, vice presidents, and 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 many different leaders have said that uh, you know all they could do was do whatever they could to make it work, so they didn't have to shut down the program, so they didn't have to stop teaching and servicing students. Um, but they didn't say that was always optimal. Um, did you, uh, through your experience, kind of being thrown right into that situation, did you come out of that with any uh, new ideas or new approaches? Uh, or was, uh, and I, I'm thinking about Cambridge College a little bit only because yeah. your brain's probably already there because yeah. you probably have so many more, uh, you know, advanced students in terms of jobs already returning to the workforce. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I, I think I learned a lot of things. Uh, but if I were to say one thing, and this this may surprise you all, I'm not sure, but um, the need to be sensitive and compassionate to people strikes me as as like like maybe the most important thing I've been thinking over the last year. People are feeling the strain. Uh, they're you know um, it, 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 they're doing all their work. It's amazing to me. How, how much continuity there has been. Uh, if, I, if I were to explain, if I would have thought myself before the pandemic, through it, now after, after it, kind of, uh, would we have maintained this much continuity in, in, in light of the changes that we've gone through? I would have predicted a, an abominable failure. Um, and it isn't. <laughs> it's amazingly successful. We've reconstituted work projects uh, we, we use this stuff so seamlessly, seamlessly and effortlessly. Uh, we were discussing earlier today at the college here, productivity. And I have to think that productivity has gone up. I, I, I mean, in some ways, people have, have um, donated their drive time to uh, working. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, we, we may have some mixed feelings about that. We do want, you know, work-life balance. But uh, the compassion piece is important. I'll just put it out there for, for whatever it might mean. Yeah, uh, Steve, also, you know, I know you work with a lot of faculty and what was amazing to me, because I, you know, I was in the midst of that transition to it, the inst my institution at the time. And uh, what amazed me, and I heard this from a lot of uh, academic leaders also is that everyone rose to the occasion, as you said, you know, it's like being understanding is one thing, but you know, uh, where you may have heard complaints before about change, you really mm -hmm. didn't hear them this time because uh, it was amazing how I heard so many faculty members, well, yeah, this is what we got to do. And, 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 and having been responsible for technology in so many institutions, you know, I would introduce change that wasn't too popular, you know, most of the time. But uh, certainly uh, a lot of people have risen to the occasion during the pandemic and it helped us all learn, you know, uh, something new, which I, I think is good. So 
Thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm going to uh, roll us to the next poll question. Uh, and this is our final one for our audience. And I please uh, take the next 30 seconds to answer this one. This is a uh, maybe a bigger picture question um, uh, about education itself. Should educators capitalize on the digital culture by incorporating technology into all aspects of education to promote 100% active student participation? Or is more innovation development and study required before technology can provide the same impactful learning as traditional methods? And what I mean by traditional methods may be, you know, your uh, traditional uh, on-ground classroom environment. You know, you have uh, the professor uh, at, at the front or the instructor at the front of the room and you have a class full of students that come every Tuesday and Thursday for, uh, you know, an hour, hour and 45 minutes uh, for a full semester, as opposed to, you know, what we've had to adopt, which is really, uh, you know, kind of this virtual online uh, an environment, uh, which some think, oh, can't wait till we get back into the classroom. I've heard that so many times. Uh, and then, you know, I just was reading an author uh, the other day, uh, yesterday morning who said, oh, well, there's, there is nothing like face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, you know, no amount of any technology can replace that uh, interpersonal interaction physically in front of each other. So, you know, I, I've also heard other uh, faculty uh, and, and uh, instructional designers say, yeah, this actually can empower faculty. You can reach students in new ways. Uh, and as Stephen said, uh, in terms of uh, being more sensitive to students, uh, we have a whole new uh, generations of students who are very used to a digital culture. That doesn't mean they're uh, experts at technology, but they're used to those environments. Mm -hmm. And uh, those environments are, uh, you know, definitely different than the, the generations prior to the current generation. So should educators really look at a sea change for all of education or uh, is this something that we should do one at a time? Um, so we just got the results of those polls in and uh, looks like no, uh, technology is more of a utility overdoing it will have negative effects. And I, I, I believe it or not, I have heard of some of that and I, I understand you know, some of the sentiment uh, to, to, toward that, uh, but none of our audience answered that. We really have almost a 50-50 split between somewhat technology can make a difference by using it uh, in flex and hybrid environments. So we have 40%, 48% of our audience answered uh, to that. And then uh, the 52% of our audience said, yes, technology is a game changer, education benefits, from its increased use and application. So looks like uh, we're not turning back and uh, we will be moving forward in, you know, kind of working uh, so where technology can benefit uh, education. So thank you for that. I'm going to move on to introduce our next panelist and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Lee Rayners. Uh, uh, he joined the Duke Global Financial Market Center as executive director in 2016. At Duke Law, Rainers teaches FinTech law and policy, as well as seminars relating to financial policy and regulatory practice. His broad research agenda focuses on how new financial technologies fit with existing regulatory frameworks. His work has examined the risks associated with cryptocurrency derivatives, the rise of digital investment advice, and corporate governance failures within the financial industry. He writes frequently on fintech and other financial regulatory matters on the FinReg blog and speaks with financial policy experts on the Global Financial Market Center's podcast, The FinReg Pod. And I put both of these links in here uh, in the presentation, which we'll send out to the audience. Uh, so you can uh, listen to Lee's uh, uh, talks and read his articles. So uh, Lee, thank you very much for joining us. It, it, it sounds like uh, you know there, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes with our finances uh, and, and you're, you're teaching all those uh, uh, financial leaders how to, 
do these things, especially with, I, I love your uh, work in cryptocurrency, which, you know, uh, so many people are saying, oh, it's a fad, it's never going to take off. Meanwhile, others are saying, this is the new uh, money, you know, everything you knew before is going away. So interesting area to work in. And thank you for joining us today. And I'll hand it right over to you. Well, thank you, Carl. It's a pleasure to to be here with you and everyone else and uh, and Stephen. So, um, you know, I think Stephen did an excellent job in sort of offering the institutional perspective um, in terms of technology and how to incorporate technology um, into the learning environment. And I think what I'll talk about will be a nice compliment because I'm really going to talk about it from um, the professor teacher standpoint in the classroom. Uh, of course, some of the some of the things I'll mention will dovetail nicely with uh, with Stephen. I agree with with everything he had to say. Um, you know, Carl, as your introduction noted, you know, obviously coming into the pandemic, I had already been teaching um, about uh, technology and specifically how new technologies are being applied um, in the financial services sector. Uh, you know, to a non-tech uh, audience. So, you know, I have been thinking, you know, even before the pandemic, quite a lot about, um, you know, how do I change what I'm doing in the classroom? Um, you know, because I'm, I'm talking about stuff that is so cutting edge. All right. I mean, you mentioned cryptocurrency, and that's, you know, increasingly taking up a lot of my, my teaching and research and, and speaking um, uh, time. Um, and it just didn't seem right to me that I would talk about this subject, you know, in front of the whiteboard, right? Um, that uh, a high tech subject matter should be um, taught in a way that incorporates tech. Um, but again, you know, my audience, my students, they're, they're law students. Um, so they're not technologists and I'm not uh, necessarily a, a technologist either, right? So um, we'll touch, about, uh, touch on some of those, those issues there. Um, you know, my first bullet point here um, is I think probably something that most folks uh, know already, which is that, you know, the legal academy has been, um, the most resistant academic discipline, I would say, when it comes to incorporating technology and the fundamental teaching and learning experience, right? It really hasn't changed all that much in, you know, uh, 200 years, really. And, and it's perfect that Stephen mentioned Socrates, right? Because at law school, we have the Socratic method, uh, which is the students have to read the textbook, right? There's assigned readings. They read the case book. Um, they show up, the professor lectures, and then he cold calls on them um, throughout the lecture with questions, right? This is the, the Socratic method. Um, and so, you know, your parents and your grandparents, you know, uh, legal education, if they went to law school, is really no different um, in a lot of ways than the experience now. Um, and so, and I think, you know, that uh, in some ways that's, that's good and kind of, um, uh, reassuring it to a lot of folks, but I think it's long overdue for, um, for a rethink. And the pandemic provided us that opportunity, right? A, f a fundamental experiment was foisted on all of us. Uh, and so we tried things. Um, and some of those things worked. And some of those things didn't work. And I think it's important from, you know, that both the teacher and the institutional um, level that we learn just as much as from our, our, I don't say failures, but from things that didn't work as uh, from what, from what did work. Um, so first, you know, I think it's pretty clear, hopefully by now that um, the digital classroom experience has to be different from the physical classroom experience. You know, I know a lot of my colleagues, when March 2020 came, we were in the midst of the spring semester. I think we were all, you know, scrambling, doing our best. Um, the students were forgiving, as we were forgiving of the students, uh, as Stephen um, mentioned. And so we were kind of all in the, the, same, the same boat there. But as we headed into the fall of, uh, of 2020, and it was apparent that, you know, institutions like at Duke, and I think most of your institutions were going to be online, that we had sufficient time as teachers and as institutions 
to revamp our curriculum and our delivery mechanism, that our students demanded that of us. And it was on us to deliver that to them, especially when they're paying, you know, what, what they're paying. And so, you know, unfortunately, I did see, you know, some of my colleagues simply try to recreate the traditional classroom experience in the digital environment. And nobody wants that, right? Students um, do not want to listen to someone talk to them on a computer screen for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, um, and then maybe jump in with, um, you know, with a question um, periodically. Um, so you had to think about how do I differentiate this digital experience? And there you know, are, are multiple ways to do that. And so that's why I say, you know, don't be afraid to, um, to experiment. I think, you know, Carl, you've kind of demonstrated how you can do that by incorporating the polls, for instance, right? Um, you know, Zoom does have that, that feature. Um, you know, I assign, you know, case studies. I actually force my students to give more presentations than they otherwise would have in the traditional classroom to, to make them be engaged and bring in their, their classmates. Um, those are just some, uh, some examples. You know, one of the things that I had done um, before the pandemic was build out a online course for the Coursera platform. And I'm sure most folks are familiar with Coursera. Um, it's called FinTech Law and Policy. You can, you can Google um, and you can audit the course for, for free, uh, shameless plug there. Uh, and I can tell you that that was a lot of work to put that course together. Um, you know, if you've ever watched Coursera or, you know, similar kind of MOOC as they're called, um, you know, they're very polished. Uh, I worked with a very good team here at Duke and our digital learning group um, who were able to kind of put together nice, uh, nice graphics for me. And, you know, frankly, had I known going into it how much work it would have uh, taken, I'm not sure I would have said yes um, to doing that. But I can tell you that I am so thankful I've done that because it's provided an evergreen resource for me. And I was able to incorporate that um, into my class when the pandemic came. And this gets to, the, I guess, jumping ahead of the bullets here, the asynchronous learning. So I could have, so I had content ready and I could tell my students, hey, I want you to watch you know, these lectures on my Coursera course. And then when you come to the virtual classroom, we're gonna have a conversation, um, right? Or we're gonna talk about, you know, kind of the latest issue that's sort of since emerged since I first recorded that. Um, now that doesn't mean that, you know, those of you watching have to go through the process of putting together highly produced, you know, videos for Coursera, right? But you can experiment. So you might even just wanna try recording, um, so I'm putting something on YouTube, for instance, right? So you can do a normal PowerPoint presentation. You can record that. You can upload that on YouTube or, you know, you can whiteboard things on, uh, on YouTube. And then again, you have that evergreen resource that you can incorporate into your classroom, the so-called flip classroom, right? So you have those resources and then you can turn the virtual experience into more of a conversation as opposed to a lecture. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. I'm sure we all have, again, you know, uh, the last two years. And, uh, and you know, don't just let that go now that we're back into, you know, uh, like here at Duke, you know, face to face, um, right? I think it's important that we embrace those, those lessons and incorporate that into our classes going, um, going forward. You know, one of the things that I really um, struggle with all the time is, you know, how do I teach cutting edge um, technology issues to a non-tech audience. Uh, and I'd imagine that some of you are in a similar situation. Now, again, the point of my class is to teach uh, what are the legal and the regulatory and the policy issues associated with these emergent technologies, right? So um, I'm not expecting my students to become, you know, blockchain programmers, right? Um, so therefore, I think it's important as a teacher to understand the principles behind new technologies and how they operate. And so you can communicate that to your, to your students. So they understand at a high level how it works. This is how it works. And these are the principles um, behind it. You know, but you don't have to get into the nitty gritty. And in fact, when it comes to my subject matter, you know, FinTech, there are a wealth of YouTube videos and other online resources. And I'd imagine many of the subjects that you all teach, there's that too. So it doesn't have to be content you necessarily created, right? Feel free to avail yourself of 
um, other, uh, you know, online content. Um, so, you know, YouTube is a great source, you know, other MOOCs. Um, and that's a way for students to kind of get up to speed on the tech. Uh, and then we can kind of focus on the legal issues um, in my audience. So, uh, and, and in my classroom. So, um, so just some tips from my experience, Carl, I know we're at the kind of, we have one minute left here. So maybe it's a good place to stop and we'll see what, uh, if, if folks have questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lee. That, that was great. And it dovetailed uh, perfectly with what uh, Steve was talking about earlier. Uh, and I, I think it gives everyone this kind of broad to very specific uh, best practices and, and approaches. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, sometimes people are looking for very prescriptive approaches on, on how to deal with these situations. But I think what you're describing now is more of a mindfulness or a philosophy or an approach. And um, I, I think what the pandemic did do for us, of course, we don't like that it happened, but it, it, it did open everyone's mind to be not so rigid, you know, not so, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, kind of temper expectations and expect, uh, you know, uh, different uh, approaches sometimes. And even mistakes or problems, right? Because we all know technology, it doesn't do what we expect it to do. And uh, uh, sometimes, but, but other times I think we refer to, you know, this kind of empowering faculty to show students things in new ways that maybe they couldn't uh, see them before or to reach students who uh, may not respond well in, in the traditional classroom online. Uh, so uh, yeah, th there's a, there's a lot to learn, but, but I love what you're saying in terms of, uh, you know, that the digital classroom has to be different than the physical classroom. And, uh, and, and also teaching technology to non-tech audience is possible. And that, that is so true. It's just a way of learning and a way of teaching. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's, that's just great insight. So, so thank you very much. And yes, you're correct. We're at the top of our hour. And I really want to thank both of our panelists, uh, Lee from Duke University, Steve from Cambridge College for joining us today, sharing your expertise and, and experiences. And uh, we will be sending this uh, uh, talk out uh, in, in a format and the presentation for all our attendees uh, to uh, review uh, at a later time if they want. And uh, any questions about Campus Consortium or uh, communications with our guests speakers uh, we're happy to uh, talk with you and coordinate uh, with our with our speakers uh, so thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to attend and again uh, to our sponsors and to our institutions that have made this ed talk possible today uh, Lee and Steve thanks very much again and uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day take care